All right, I uh, realize the last speaker ran right up into uh, this speech. But uh, I would like to introduce uh, Jody Emery, if you may. Wife of uh, Mark Emery, she will explain her trials and tribulations and how she comes to be spending way too much time traveling back and forth from uh, the place where he is involuntarily incarcerated rather than uh, enjoying their lives as they should as free individuals. So please welcome Jodri Emery. Well, thank you so much for having me to New Hampshire. I haven't been out on the East Coast except for Georgia to visit my husband uh, once when he was there. But it's great to come to the free state uh, where you can live free or die. And that's been really exciting as a Canadian from Vancouver, BC, who really looks up to a lot of the activism happening in the United States. And I have kind of an interesting relationship with the United States. I'm not sure how many of you know about my husband, Mark Emery. Can I get a show of hands just so I can know how much? Okay, well, great. I don't need to give you much of an overview. Um, but I am going to tell you some of the things that my husband did even long before I was born, quite frankly. Uh, he's been fighting for liberty, and there are a number of things he did that... Uh, were very inspiring and not many people who know about Mark Emery, the marijuana activist, know about Mark Emery, the freedom and liberty activist. So his history goes quite a ways back. He decided to drop out of high school in London, Ontario in uh, grade 12 and open a bookstore. He just wanted to go into business. He had been very uh, good with money since he was a small child and realized that school wasn't really going to do much for him and it's better to learn by experiencing life than to sit in a classroom. So he opened up a bookstore called it City Lights Bookshop and it wasn't just a store, it was a place for people to come and have heated conversations. Mark was always known for being very opinionated and uh, very much a loud mouth and that of course got him into quite a bit of trouble and as you know it got him in trouble with the US federal government eventually. But it started out small. He decided to um, sell books on Sunday. Now, it was illegal to sell books on Sunday in London, in Ontario, in fact. And he thought this was absolutely outrageous. Anybody who wasn't observing a religious day uh, of rest should be able to go and buy anything they want. And instead of even selling books, he thought, what if I just give books away? What if I open my store and give books away on Sunday? And they said, you can't do that. And he said, OK, it's the Sunday before Christmas. I'm going to dress up as Santa Claus and I'm going to go and hand out books. They said, you can't do that. Uh, so he decided to keep trying to change this and eventually got charged and refused to pay the fine and said, no, I'm going to go to prison. And they put him in jail. And he sat there and that was his first experience behind bars for a belief and he didn't want to get out. But his customer said, Mark, don't be silly. And they paid his fine and they bailed him out. But that was his first taste uh, of standing up for what you believe in no matter the consequences. And it went on after that. He fought against the business improvement associations and the fees they wanted to put on businesses. Um, garbage pickup decided to stop in the city. The union went on strike. So he rented a big truck and bought out ads in the paper and said, I'll come pick up your garbage. And he would. He would go and he'd go pick up their garbage and push it into the truck. And he said, the stinkiest things on earth are not baby diapers, but grass, cut grass, turns into methane. And he says, it's just horrible smells. But he would get threats. He would get threats from union members saying, you know, you're going to pick up a bag with battery acid in it or, you know, different things like that. They were really upset about it. But he continued until the strike ended. And he would do other little acts as well, like put coins in parking meters and say they shouldn't be charging people and all sorts of civil disobedience. And he went into publishing as well. He published his own newspapers, uh, thinking that, you know, the media establishment wasn't covering the stories they ought to. Lost a lot of money in that, as I'm sure all activists and people in publishing know is uh, very easy to do. It's expensive to do that. But he continued. And if you want to rewind a bit in his life, his father was an NDP, New Democratic Party. That's the Socialist Party of Canada. And Mark grew up helping in elections as a little boy, hammering in NDP signs. And one day he uh, met, I think it was Bob Metz of a Libertarian Party, who gave him a copy of Ayn Rand's 
the Fountainhead and said, you should read this. And he did. And he read Atlas Shrugged and he read more of Ayn Rand's work and decided, I've been absolutely wrong. Everything I've been doing is backwards. I've got to fight for liberty. And he had free speech radio where he went off against the establishment and lost that show for being a little too controversial, as always. He would get a little bit of trouble for that. And he d was holding this radio show, and he had been fighting against government in many different forms. When he discovered uh, Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys had a little segment called Grow More Pot. And Mark listened to this, and it was about the mystery of hemp, cannabis, and how there was a conspiracy. And a book had been put out called The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrera, who's a very well-known, uh, the late activist Jack Herrera. And Mark discovered that this book was illegal in Canada. Canada had banned all literature about drugs. So High Times Magazine, a pamphlet about marijuana, anything like that would get you a $10,000 fine, which was worse of a penalty than possession of cannabis. And he thought, as an activist, this is outrageous. How can a country ban literature? How can you ban books and information? And he had also fought against censorship of pornography and music. Two Live Crew was a rap group, and he drove down into Detroit, bought a bunch of Two Live Crew albums, brought them up to Canada, took an ad in the paper, said, I'm selling illegal music. Come and bust me. Come take me to court so we can fight this. It's outrageous. And he did the same with High Times Magazine. But by the time he started that, the police weren't going with it anymore. They knew his, his gig. They knew he was trying to get arrested to try and change the laws. And he had been successful in many campaigns. The Sunday shopping laws were overturned. Uh, Mark stopped the Pan Am games from coming to London, Ontario by relentlessly campaigning to stop the waste of taxpayers' dollars. And the police at this point thought, no, don't pay any attention to Emery and his new pot crusade. We don't care about him trying to sell these magazines and books. And Mark was getting frustrated by then. He had run with the Libertarian. Libertarian Party, the Freedom Party, the Un-Party. He had been trying to find some way of changing the system and got, in a, got nowhere, really, after a bit of time. He thought Canadians are so quiet and so laid back, and they don't care. They don't care about liberty, so I don't care about them. They Screw Canada, I'm out. And he went and took off to India and Indonesia with his common-law wife and their two children, whom they had homeschooled. She also got fined for homeschooling her children. So they left Canada, and while he was abroad, he read an article in the paper about the Canadian election. And this is a foreign paper, state government controlled, and it had a little blurb on the bottom about Canadian politicians are potheads, and it said how to all the candidates had admitted at some point of using marijuana. And aren't you proud? Your country isn't washed in drugs, and you know, they're really against it. But Mark thought, well, that's interesting. And there was a little segment about how BC on the West Coast was where most marijuana was being grown in Canada. So he said, you know what, let's go back to Canada. Let's go to Vancouver and start a hemp retail capitalist revolution. And that was his idea, to go to Vancouver, and he did. He moved to Vancouver in 1994 and decided to go door to door selling illegal High Times magazines because at this point it hadn't been overturned yet, the uh, rules against literature, and said, you know, I've got this Grow Your Own Stone book and High Times magazine, five bucks a piece, and people bought them. And he kept selling them door to door on the street at bus stations to anybody and everybody who would listen. And at this time, there also weren't any hemp shops or head shops in Canada. They had been wiped out in the 1980s by conservative. Uh, push against all the immigrants actually who ran stores. It was mostly little novelty boutiques, you know, run with a few bongs in the corner. But Mark decided that we needed more than that and he opened up Hemp BC and did a legal aid center and started selling bongs and pipes, again saying, this is illegal, come get me if you want to, let's take this to court. And the police did, over the years, arrest him in Vancouver, uh, mostly because he was selling marijuana seeds. Mark had this idea that Americans, particularly at this time in 1996, that was California passed their medical marijuana laws, and that's the first state to move forward with that. But you had all these people saying, well, where do we get seeds? Amsterdam won't sell them to us. Nobody sends seeds to America. They'd be insane to do it. So Mark said, well, I'm insane. I'll do it. You know, he thought, there's a lot of people who need the seeds. They need this medicine, and I'll do it. And what I'll also do is I'll take all the money I get 
and put it back into political activism so I can promise every person who sends me money will know that it's not going to be going to my pockets. It's going to be going for freedom activism all across the country and the world. And that's how he started his big scheme that got him in trouble with the U.S. federal government. Now, that was 1994. He was selling seeds. He was wholesaling bongs, books, pipes, magazines. Started his own magazine, Cannabis Canada, which turned into Cannabis Culture. And... He got in trouble with the police. They raided him. They took millions of dollars worth of stock. Over and over again, they would raid him, but mostly when he would get U.S. media exposure. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Rolling Stone magazine, CNN did a big segment in 1997, which made business really, really good for him, and he got millions and millions and millions of dollars sent to him, and he put it all out back there um, after paying, of course, for the stock. you got to pay for the seeds before you sell them. But he had high prices, and people said, we don't care. We know what he's doing with it. He funded political parties in the United States and Canada started the U.S. Marijuana Party, gave money to activists to give to other candidates who were running for legalization or any sort of freedom activi activities. He sponsored uh, ballot initiatives, so Colorado, D.C., and Nevada right now have legal medical marijuana because he helped give them money. He gave money to Marijuana Policy Project, who are now a multi-million dollar lobbying group in the United States. He gave money to conferences. He sued the U.S. federal government with over 60 patients who he flew to Philadelphia to testify and did all sorts of activities like this for over a decade. Very popular, very well known all across the world. He had specials done on him everywhere and he had never left Canada. He figured, you know, I pay my income tax, which he did. He would meet with the Canadian Revenue Service and they would say, Mr. Emery, how are seed sales going? And he would say, they're going very well. You can look at my bank account. You can look at all this. I won't tell you who gets the money or, you know, he didn't keep incriminating info, of course, but he was very open about his own income and what he was doing with that. And the DEA, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, knew about all this. John Walters, your drug czar, came up to Canada to speak to our Canadian police in 2002. And he, Mark bought a table at the conference with a bunch of activists, <laughs> and they decided to heckle John Walters. So while he stood up there saying, Canada can't legalize it or we'll shut down the border, and you know, marijuana kills young people, and Mark and his table of activists would yell things out like, liar, bullshit. <laughs> you know, they were just, they were really giving it to him. And at that time, we had just had a municipal election, so we had a mayor elect and the former mayor, and the transition was happening. And a lot of national media were there in that room filming it. And John Walters looks at Mark in his table and he goes, I don't know who you are. I've never heard of you. You can't talk to me like that. And getting really mad at him and really yelling at him. But the mayor and the mayor-elect were interviewed and asked about the drug czar. And they said, he's an idiot. He's a complete and total idiot. If he thinks he can shut down the Canadian-US border, go ahead and try. So John Walters was really upset about that and met with the Vancouver police. Cash Heed, whom I actually ran against in our provincial election in 2009, he was in charge of the drug squad and he went down to the pot block where Mark's store was and that's where an investigation began. The interesting thing though is that the investigation was done in Canada because Mark, of course, never left Canada did all his activities in Vancouver, very publicly. His cell phone number was out there. Anybody could talk to him or see him any time. He ran in federal elections. He was very vocal, very visible, and didn't shy away from it. And again, always asked the authorities, come try and bust me. Well, let's take it to court, and I'll prove you wrong, and I'll fight for this. So the Vancouver police did do an investigation, and which we found out only after the U.S., came into Canada and got a hold of him. We found out that the Vancouver police did investigate him, but the BC Crown, the prosecution, decided not to lay charges because there wasn't a public interest and it wasn't worthwhile. And after that happened, the file, admitted by a Vancouver Police Department officer, the file made its way to the DEA over the border in Washington State. And unbeknownst to us, in 2005, early 2005, Mark was indicted on three charges in the Western District of Washington for conspiracy to manufacture marijuana, conspiracy to distribute marijuana, 
conspiracy to launder the proceeds of crime. What this meant was, of course, he knew people were ordering marijuana, growing mar or ordering seeds to grow marijuana, and that the money was being spent and given to people. They saw it all. They saw the money going through the bank accounts. And he couldn't avoid the sentence that he was facing. It was 30 years minimum, mandatory minimum, to life in prison. On July 29, 2005, when Mark was in Halifax out on the east coast of Canada about to speak at a medical marijuana rally, he was approached by police officers and a bunch of vehicles that came up around him, pulled out a warrant and said, you're under arrest for extradition to the United States of America. Mark Scott Emery, a.k.a. the Prince of Pot, wanted by the DEA. Now, none of us saw that coming. We figured if he was going to get in trouble with anyone, it should have been and, and would have been the Canadian police. Now, how is it that a foreign government can come into another foreign country and charge somebody and get them into their prison system when they never even left their country? Canada was in an uproar. People were outraged. They were furious. Uncle Sam screw off. They were so mad. And of course, George Bush was president down here and a lot of Canadians didn't really like him either. So there was a lot of anger towards the U.S., particularly since our own decriminalization bill had been foiled by the U.S. government vetoing it. I mean, I don't know why they get a veto over us unless we're the 51st state and I didn't get the memo, but it's true. They did stop Canada from decriminalizing marijuana when our own prime minister said, I'll have my joint in one hand and the fine in the other. You know, he was there. We were ready. We were ready to legalize it in 2000 to 2005, but it didn't happen. And it's interesting to note how much has changed in the U.S. since they tried to take Mark down. You know, he was... Facing these 30 years to life in prison along with two co-accused, Michelle Rainey and Greg Williams. Michelle Rainey was struggling from Crohn's disease for most of her life, uh, suffering greatly, and she was diagnosed with cancer, melanoma, and then lymph node cancer. It spread throughout her body, and she was facing life in prison too. And so Mark said that he would take a plea deal in order to make sure Greg and Michelle did not go to prison in the US. Now we worked on that for a while and the US government even agreed to a plea deal where Mark would be imprisoned in Canada, but the Canadian government, a conservative government by then, said that they weren't interested in that deal and told the US no for the first time ever, I think, in history. You know, they said, no, we don't want that deal. We want him to go down there. We want him to face US justice. So Mark was offered another plea deal, five years in US federal prison, two years probation for your co-accused. So Michelle and Greg did get to go and plead guilty and come back home to Vancouver where Michelle uh, lived out the rest of her life until October 2010 when she passed away. Uh, Greg still works for me with Pot TV, which is one of Mark's greatest uh, investments, you could say. Over a quarter million dollars he spent on an internet channel called Pot TV. And it was done as one of the first news video websites in Canada, launched on the same day as our national news broadcaster. And it compiled thousands and thousands of hours of news and footage, documentaries, activism reports from across the United States, even Oklahoma, people in the furthest reaches of where it was darkest and, and hardest to make a difference. He gave them a voice. He gave them a platform. He paid people money to be activists and over 10 years spent at least $4 million that he could remember. He didn't keep records. It was just, oh, you need 10 grand? Okay, I'll get back to me. A check going out to you. You need five? Do you have a conference? Do you have a political party? Anyone and everyone. He committed money everywhere because his motto was to plant the seeds of freedom and overgrow the government, a peaceful botanical revolution, not to overthrow violently, but to keep growing your own medicine, growing a plant, a natural plant, using the money to make a difference politically, because the government has all the guns. I mean, not down here, you guys have your gun rights, but up in Canada, we, uh, you know, you've got the gangsters on one side, the government on the other, and they've got all the weapons, uh, so you need at least some money to try and make a difference. So again, Mark did face this long period in prison and he agreed finally to serve a five-year sentence and he was extradited on May 10th, 2010. He was actually taken over the border 10 days later. He waited in Seattle for his sentencing. That's a maximum security facility. And then he agreed to his plea deal, got five-year sentence and was supposed to go to California, but ended up in a private prison in Georgia, in Folkestone, Georgia, a new facility by Geo Group which is an international prison uh, company on the stock market, worth a lot of money if you want to invest in it, but uh, I would recommend against that if you 
want to feel be able to sleep at night yeah right so so mark spent time in this prison it was mostly illegal immigrants and and small-time drug offenders but foreigners um in the u.s it's a lot cheaper to send all the foreign prisoners into really shoddy really badly run prisons which are mostly under private control now i'm all for the private market too as is mark but when it comes to incarcerating people and making uh, humans kind of a stock you know you've got your warehouses and you need stock in them and the stock are the people and if the crime rate is dropping and you know decrim laws are being introduced you've got private prison companies lobbying to stop decriminalization and to stop legalization because they are promising their shareholders an increase in their investment so they have to maintain at least a certain threshold of prisoners which when you think about it that's your brothers and sisters that's your nonviolent people hundreds of thousands of nonviolent Americans and other people from around the world in these prisons to make a buck for someone else and that's really the reason Mark would get into activism long ago is because the state and the government was hurting people who hurt no one else and no matter what the issue is whether it was civil rights or whether it's gay rights or women's rights or any issue on earth if you're not hurting anyone else the government has zero right to hurt you, to take anything from you, to take away your liberties or your freedoms. But that's happening on an enormous scale with the war on drugs. People don't realize that this isn't a fight just to get high so a bunch of hippies don't have to fear the cops. It's not about that at all. It's about one in 100 American citizens behind bars. It's about one quarter of the prisoners in the entire world are in US prisons. It's about women who are serving time behind bars because their boyfriend sold some weed and they didn't even know. It's about communities being devastated at an enormous cost to the taxpayers and to society. Because even worse than just putting away these nonviolent drug offenders is that they are then forced to work for pennies an hour in a private prison facility that's been contracted out by the military or by private companies that can get slave labor rates so they don't have to pay you, the free Americans, a proper decent living wage. So when you have people being taken off the streets, away from their families, leaving children without fathers, put into a prison so they can be forced to build the military goods that are taken overseas to destroy other people's lives, meanwhile Americans are stuck with how much debt? How much debt do each American you know, do you have on your so you don't even want to know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. And as Peter Schiff mentioned last night, just get out of the country. <laughs> you know, just go. But it is an enormous cost. And so when people think, oh, who cares about, you know, Mark Emery and these activists just smoking pot and they just, you know, they just want to get high. It's not about that. It's about civil liberties. It's about freedom from the oppression of the government. And when we talk about the worst civil liberties violation going on right now in North America, it is the drug war. It is the drug war. It's a racist war that continues to put people behind bars who should not be there, and it's going to continue. I just read yesterday that only the US Bureau of Prisons got an increase in their budget, in the recently released budget. Everybody else is cutting back, but prisons keep getting more and more money. And that's what Mark kept fighting against. He kept saying there are people being locked up and having their lives destroyed, and this is just wrong. It is wrong in every which way. And to lose my husband to a foreign country when they come into my own country and to take him and to put him down here where he's been put in a private prison, he's been put in solitary confinement for blogging from prison. He spent three weeks locked up in the hole for telling people about what was going on. He's been shuffled around the country. Geo Group, the private prison corporation, had him in Georgia in their facility there. He blogged about it on an old typewriter. He mailed it out and a friend of mine who's actually here, she would manually type that up and put them online. And you can read those blogs and you can see the way that they deprived basic standards of living to so many people. And Geo Group and the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Prisons got together and said, get that guy out of there and shut him up. So Geo Group put him on a bus all by himself and sent him to Mississippi where he is now in a medium security facility. Now, when I heard that he was being sent to Mississippi, I thought, well, you know, there's a few places in the US I thought he wouldn't go or I wished he wouldn't go. And I listed off places like Georgia, Mississippi. And sure enough, you know, there they send him. And it, it's it's very hard to be apart from someone when they're in prison. You know, when you're out in the real world and your loved one falls ill or they feel sick, you can be there to hold their hand. You can Google up what are the symptoms and help them get better. But when your loved one is in prison, like my husband Mark is, 
it's so it's such a helpless feeling to not be able to do anything and just even the last few days he's been nauseous a bit and I'm just worried sick like what could that be what could that be he got MRSA while he was behind bars he got infected with this the super bug that's resistant to treatment because that happens a lot in prisons it's a disease breeding ground and he was sent away to a better prison I have to say even though I was worried about Mississippi the Federal Bureau of Prisons runs better prisons than private companies do, and so he's been sent somewhere basically where he doesn't have much to complain about besides being behind bars, but he doesn't complain about being locked up. He doesn't complain and say, I shouldn't be here, I should be let go. He doesn't do that because he knew what he was getting into, he knew there were consequences, and he was willing to brave those consequences and he's making a difference. He's impacted a lot of people's lives. He's never been threatened in prison. He's never been harmed. He's never mistreated. Everybody looks up to him because even the guards say, you shouldn't be here. What are you doing here? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. What is a Canadian doing all the way down here for selling seeds? And the answer to that is it's not even about selling seeds because when he was arrested in 2005, the DEA put out a press release and you can see this press release, the official document at freemark.ca, that's our website, and it's Mark with a C. You can find it by just Google Mark Emery or Cannabis Culture. But the DEA's own press release didn't mention seeds once. It said, today's arrest of Mark Scott Emery is a significant blow to the marijuana legalization movement. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of Emery's illicit profits have been sent to legalization groups active in the U.S. and Canada legalization activists now have one less pot of money to rely on. Isn't that funny? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the political document. This document said this man is being arrested for his activism, for being a publisher. They admitted that it was about his publishing the magazine. There are seed sellers all over the world and all over in the United States. I mean, at the same time, you've got millions of pounds of weed being grown and sold throughout California and other states in the US. So it wasn't about that. It was about the political activism and they weren't afraid to say so. But there's ways that we can look at this and I like to be positive, Mark likes to be positive, you know, being depressed is really tough because time drags by and you get nothing done. But when you're trying to stay busy and optimistic, you get a lot done, time goes by faster and you feel accomplished. And Mark always said it was like out of Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi says to Darth Vader, strike me down, Darth, and you'll make me more powerful than you can ever imagine. And sure enough, that's what happens. When the government reaches too far, that's when the people take note. That's when change starts to happen. And you need the government to overreach. You need them to do something so grossly horrific that people go, you know what, I don't smoke pot, I don't care about stoners, that's wrong. That's wrong that a foreign country can go into another country and take a citizen from there. That's wrong that they can do that for activism, not even for real criminal activity. It's just wrong in so many ways and people start to wonder about this issue. They start to think maybe it's more than just about getting high. Maybe Mark Emery represents millions and millions of people who are locked up right now, who don't have a media following, who don't have a family to back them up, who don't have a dollar to spend on a phone call. They have nothing and they are deprived of their liberty, of their freedom, of everything that they were guaranteed to have by being an American citizen. There are so many locked up right now and they don't get to have many advocates because I tell you, it's hard to advocate for prisoners' rights. It is really, really hard because people see prisoners as the bad people. They've done wrong. That's the worst of society. If you're locked up, you're the worst because you're the bad guy that did so bad. You got caught and you're in prison, so no rights for you, no TV for you, no fresh air or sunlight for you. You know, people don't care about prisoners. So we need to remind them that most of these people are non-violent. They're not bad people. Yes, please put away the violent, dangerous threats to society. I'm not campaigning to free those people. I'm campaigning to free those who have harmed no others and who are harmed every day they're behind bars and whose families are harmed by losing them, their communities are harmed by losing them, and the taxpayers are harmed by paying insane amounts of money to keep these people locked up. And that's 
what we've been fighting against, and that's something that I try to turn this experience into, that this is our fight for liberty. This is about so many people who have no voice. And Mark and I, if we can represent those who are victims of this drug war, then we're going to make the most of the situation and do just that. Because we've seen since 2005, there's been an enormous reversal. In Canada, we've elected a conservative, neoconservative, not at all libertarian type conservative government in Stephen Harper. And these, they have been pretty much uh, unencumbered. There's no opposition uh, because the opposition leaders are either dead or unelected. We have some leadership races going on. Um, very scary situation right now in Canada. And our government has declared a war on the cannabis culture. They even said that it's a culture war. It's a war on the music of the Beatles. Like that's what our prime minister said. My son is asking me about what the Beatles lyrics mean. What am I gonna tell him? And I, can you believe this? And he says it's a culture of permissiveness. And so they are bringing in mandatory minimums which have been in place in the US for a long time and are even being reversed here. Our government is bringing them into place in Canada and refusing to step down besides having all of these officials and representatives, even Texas. The Texas said to Canada, please don't repeat our mistake. And our government is like, we are not listening to you. We have donations from private prison corporations that are being pledged, so we've got to pass it. And that's the only thing that can explain this. Like, why would a government ignore the people, ignore the public opinion, ignore the research, the facts, ignore everything that goes against what they want to do? And it's always about the money. It's always about the money. Follow the money. Who's making the money? Que bono. Who benefits? Who's, who's winning out of this? Because the taxpayers aren't winning. The gangsters, oh, they're winning. <laughs> Has anyone looked at Mexico recently? You know, I mean, th this drug war is a massive failure, but somebody's making a buck off of it. And that's why Mark was silenced by the US federal government. The DEA, who indicted Mark Emery for conspiracy to launder money, admitted in your mainstream media that they launder millions of dollars for drug cartels. Straight up admit it. Yeah, sorry, yeah, we're taking their money and laundering it to see where it goes, but gosh, we couldn't figure that out. You know, same with the guns. You know, you got the government doing the same thing as the gangsters, and that's why I always say this one slogan. Politicians who support prohibition are supporting organized crime. Because you can go up to any politician who is supporting this drug war and say, you realize that nobody is winning from what you want to propose, except for the gangsters. You know, the, Can the taxpayers, Canadian and American, are losing out. The civil liberties are being stripped. You know, so many of these laws being introduced, these prisons being built across Canada by our conservative government, those are hurting everybody. That's just, that doesn't worry just me. You know, we've got our environmental activists now in Canada being called a threat to the security of the nation. I mean, that's old news down here, but Canada's basically following in a lot of the bad footsteps of the United States. And we're trying to look at the good direction that's going on. Because as I said, there has been a big difference since 2005. You've got legalization initiatives on state ballots down here. Even the fact that you have states' rights is amazing in Canada. Once our government gets a majority government, the opposition can't stop anything. And that's the scenario we have right now is that our, our prime minister has more power than your president does in getting stuff done because whatever he wants, he gets if he has majority government. And they won that last May after a few years of minority rule. And they're bringing in massive military expansion, massive prisons all across the country, so many ways that we're going backwards. Decrim is just a dream, hope we can get back on track in eight years from now. You know, we have dark days in Canada, but our activists are now looking to the US and saying, look at them, look, they, they knew it was wrong. They've discovered that it's wrong. They're saying reverse it. And there is progress being made on that front, despite the budget increases for the prisons. There is a lot of progress being made. Mandatory minimums are being repealed. People are being released for being nonviolent drug offenders. And like I said, you've got decrim and legalization and medical marijuana on, in so many states. I can't believe I was in Massachusetts where everyone's like, oh, it's just decrim and you don't even need to give a real name. And I'm like, I can't even do that in Canada. Like, what's going on? But it's great that it's going on because this is something that we need America to do first. The US won't let Canada or any other country legalize it. So if the US does it first, 
the rest of the world can follow. And that's why it's so important that we look towards the activists in the United States who are getting stuff done, not just on the front of marijuana, medical marijuana, but just on the front of freedom, of liberty. I can tell you there are a lot of Canadians who love Ron Paul, and I'm one of them. I learned about Ron Paul back in 2006 when my husband did an article for Cannabis Culture called The 2006 Stoner's Voter's Guide, where he analyzed the voting record of every member of Congress down here on 10 different issues, and those mostly included hemp, drug war, but also other issues too, just in like war in general, and found that Ron Paul was the number one defender of liberty on all counts. And for us to tell our left-leaning pot activist types that we're supporting a Republican from Texas, they just thought we were losing our minds. But it's amazing that you even have that down here. You have a Republican who can be so different from another Republican, and they're allowed to do it. In Canada, if you are a member of the Liberal Party and you don't want to support the Liberal Party's policy on whatever, you can't speak out against it or you're not getting your nomination paper signed next time around. So quite frankly, in Canada, we have four people ruling the country, the four leaders of the party. One, again, which died, well, Jack Layton died of cancer right after the election. Uh, the Liberal Party and the Bloc Québécois were both decimated. So the Conservatives have free reign. And like I said, they're just going crazy, doing a lot of damage uh, across Canada. And we need the example down here. It's so inspiring to see people. And even at this forum, at the dinner last night, like, there's 250 people in here. This is so cool. That, that's just a small taste of the number of Americans who really do believe in liberty and getting the government off your back and being able to do what you want, when you want, as long as you're not hurting anyone else. And as long as my husband is in prison, and he will be in prison still until July 9th, 2014, that's the earliest that he's going to be able to get out. That's for good behavior, 85% of the sentence. You know, until he comes home, I am going to keep doing this. And when he comes back, we're going to do the same as well. Because like, like I already said, out of Star Wars, you know, strike me down, you'll make me stronger than you can ever imagine. And Mark has inspired so many people across the country who don't look to him as a leader that they follow. That was the other important thing Mark always said. Don't see me as your leader. Don't join my club. Don't be a follower of me. Be a leader yourself. Take my example. Do something yourself. Because the individual is far more powerful than to try and get a whole group together. Mark never had to go to a meeting with a bunch of people on a board and be like, all right, let's pass a motion to discuss this. You know, it, groups talk about getting stuff done in a lot of cases. But individuals can get stuff done on your own. And he's always been a defender of that. And he's a great example example of it and inspires so many people across the world today. We get messages from people in every country on earth who say that Mark has inspired them and they want to make a difference. They're in countries where they can be executed for even talking about marijuana if they were to be caught with it. But they see his example and they say somebody needs to make a difference here. Somebody needs to take a stand. And Ron Paul once said something I really liked. He said you can make a difference in three different ways. You can get involved in politics. You can educate people, and you can engage in civil disobedience. And you can only engage in civil disobedience if you're willing to accept the consequences. Like, you can't just say, yeah, I'm going to break the law, but don't, don't come after me. You know, you have to be willing to take a stand like Mark did in so many issues where he said, no, music should not be illegal in Canada. Books should not be illegal in Canada. I'm going to go to prison to make a point. And that's what he's doing right now. He's sitting in a Mississippi federal prison where many people look to him and look to me and say, it's wrong what's happened to that couple. And it's wrong that it's happening to so many other couples. It's wrong that families are being destroyed and that 70% of the children of inmates are going to go to prison themselves one day. It's a, it's a machine that's meant to keep people enslaved and we're trying to make a difference in that sense. So if I can just come and speak about it like I am now and let you know that there are people who are backing this and it's not just about pot, it's about liberty. I think many of you can agree that this drug war is wrong for so many reasons and you don't have to be pro-pot to be anti-prohibition. You just need to be pro-liberty and it all falls into place. So I'm not sure how much more time you guys want me to speak on. It's 4.10 right now. But I tend to take questions and answers. If there are any at all, um, I'd be happy to entertain that. So. Do you have any uh, suggestions, recommendations for people running for office at the national, local levels to help prevent this? Uh, like what's happening? 
Well, if you can get anybody to speak out against prohibition, um, especially turning enemies into allies, it's a very powerful voice. Um, you need to, you just need to get people to, to be willing to commit to it because once you have one politician willing to stand up and say, you know, I don't smoke it, but you know, we need to look at this. You'll have more people coming out in favor. In, in BC, for example, we have four former mayors who joined together with a new organization to say, we need to legalize it. None of this decrim, you know, halfway measure, we need to legalize it. And the current mayor decided to come out and agree with them, even though it's most politically risky to say something while you're in office. It's always easy to say something after, but uh, you need to get them to be able to bring others on board. And while you're running, you know, I ran with the BC Green Party in 2009, and that was just because they had asked me to, and they supported ending prohibition. So I thought, well, if you're supporting my issue, then I'm going to support you. And I did run then, and we made it a big issue. There was a lot of gang violence going on at the time. But when I was asked to run in the federal election, I decided not to because I wanted to be able to support any candidate from any party who took up this issue. So I didn't want to be about a party. I want to be about the issue because being against prohibition is not partisan. You know, it's not an issue of what side of the political spectrum you're on. It's something that everybody can get behind. And so I also declined to run in municipal government as well because of the same reason. They wanted me to just stick to their issue. And can you get rid of your old pot videos and stuff? And I thought, well, if you want me for me, then take my issue, take me and have it. So there's some people who might... Um, be willing to listen to your message and take you on board and get your advice uh, who might be willing to have you run as a candidate and if they don't take you as a candidate there are people who are happy to be educated they don't know anything about pot they have no clue everybody's talking about legalization and they don't even know what it looks like so if you can educate them on those issues and say here I'm going to send you some info here's some talking points here's what somebody else is saying that you might be able to get in touch with that makes a very powerful statement and even Mark's own prosecutor, John McKay, he has since switched sides and is now backing a legalization initiative for Washington State in the very state Mark was indicted in. And I had a chance to meet him, and a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, here comes Emery's wife to meet Emery's prosecutor. It's going to be a showdown. But, you know, I wasn't angry about it. I went up to him and I shook his hand and said, I want to thank you for joining our side and taking a stand. And the first thing he does is steps back and says, oh, I never met your husband. I don't, you know, I'm getting all nervous. I didn't mean to do that. And I, I, I know it wasn't personal, but I'm just telling you now, as a former drug warrior joining our side, your message is so powerful and I have to thank you for that. And he said, that's very gracious of you. And I knew that that would stick with him a lot better than me going up and saying, you're a scumbag, you know, like, like that, that wouldn't have had any sort of impact, but for him to go, oh my goodness, like she, you know, what have, what have, what have I been doing, you know, that put him on the spot, but it's going to stick with him, and he's joining up with a lot of other political representatives now, and they are going to be probably passing that bill. <laughs> I'm just going to say, did you charge him to talk to some other prosecutors and you know, get on board, you know, you know be an evangelist for it. Uh, what I really want to com about, comment about is you brought up uh, uh, gangsters and government. Uh, to a lot of us here, there, there is there, the no difference. gangsters are the ones particularly operating out of Washington, D.C., and I call them the worst terrorists because they're creating terror all over the place. Well, are you terrified of them? What's no, terrorism, right? No, <laughs> you know? no, not at all. Yeah. Because they're, 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 they're sick idiots. And, <laughs> and, 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 having a, and having a clue, but I, I really think that, that, that the understanding is that they only get power because it's been given to them from the people. And, and that, that we really, we really got to make people understand that the power is theirs. Oh well, yeah. And, and, and that if, 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 if they start not consenting, if they start doing things like, you know, interfering with paying their taxes, that you know, don't fund them. I, I, I really think that, you know, I, I don't, the political thing has not really met very much. I mean, right. we, we supposedly have a, 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 a majority of people who think that, that marijuana ought to be legalized, at least for oh, yeah. use. And, and yet, you know, they, they do what they do and, and, and they're out of hand and we've got to pull back our power. That's one of the things that, that 
that right. each and there is a risk of that too because of course people do go to prison if you don't pay your taxes you know you can face uh, the harms of the state if you try and but that's really actually not true the, the, the fact is is that that 50 percent of people in america don't pay federal income tax the law actually does not state that you're liable I, right. It is kind of a big scam that people have been bought into. And that's what's most disappointing and most difficult is because it is an establishment in place. That reason doesn't work with them. Logic doesn't work with them. There's some other motive at play. And, you know, left, right, Republican, Democrat, are they really any different? No, the only one who's different is somebody who says what Ron Paul is saying. I mean, no, I, no, no. I yeah, exactly. You know, just live by the Constitution and that will make everything right. And that's why I have to support Ron Paul because he is going to pardon all the nonviolent drug offenders because he will end the drug war, which wastes millions, billions of dollars every year. He'll restore your privacy and your civil liberties. He'll get rid of the Patriot Act. We're having so many problems in Canada now where they are implementing a lot of laws based on U.S. laws. We have a Patriot Act type thing coming in and SOPA and all that. It's all being introduced in Canada. Now we have our shared borders. Um, so we've got the security perimeter arrangement and I figure if we're all just kind of one country anyway, just get it over with and we'll campaign together. Um, so, you know, that's all. Let's make it one big free state, you know, and just spread it out all across. Um, but I, I can agree. It's very discouraging when you realize that the system is pretty much a fraud. You know, even in these elections, a lot of there's a vote rigging going on there's all sorts our own federal government was found guilty of illegally spending millions of dollars in the last federal election and they were charged with it and found guilty but there's no penalty for it and just the other day they found uh, they were doing robocalls out to the op opponents uh, voters in ridings where it was a really close race and they were doing robocalls on the day of the election saying your polling station has been moved. Please go to, yeah, and they just, this is in the news just right now, today, yesterday, and the federal government, conservative party, it was a company that they had hired, and then they went and they found some 23-year-old kid and said, he did it, he did it, oh, he admitted to, okay, it's all over, it's all good, it was just one bad apple, you know, and uh, <laughs> the whole bunch isn't rotten, you know, <laughs> you know but, and, and so it can be really frustrating, and that's why I found, you know, I didn't want to run in these elections anymore, and Mark, Mark wants me to run eventually. He says I'm a lot more politically appealing than he can be with his baggage, as he calls it. But um, it's hard because it is just a big fraud. It's not fair. You're, you don't really get representation. And even in Canada, it's worse. He had the Green Party got 10% of the federal vote and got zero seats in the House of Commons. And the Bloc Québécois from Quebec, they got the same percentage of vote and they had like 50 some odd seats. So the system is rigged and it's really hard to fight against that. But you, again, you've got to choose which way you want to be active. Education by informing people, which I consider this event to be very educational. And by talking to people and opening their minds, you know, yeah, good for them. I just want to give a hand for the Liberty Forum. Like, because... Sharing ideas is so important. Ideas don't die. There's, you know, and to spread that knowledge on, go ahead and do it. And try and do as many of the ways you can be active as you can. I choose to educate people. I choose to kind of get involved in the political process. I don't do civil disobedience because while my husband's away, I'll, uh, I'll wait on that one. Um, it certainly got him in quite a bit of trouble, of course. So. But I also want to remind people that, you know, sometimes you can be in a situation where it is really depressing. It's really hard to figure out, you know, how do you stay strong? How do you keep going? People ask me that. I could ask other people that. I see people much worse off than I do. And I always think, you know, if you tend to compare yourself to those who have more than you or to think of what you don't have and what you wish you had and you don't get to get this, you're going to be miserable. So do like Mark always did and like I try to do. Be grateful that you can see. Be grateful that you can walk. Be grateful that you're in North America and not in some really godforsaken place, you know? Be grateful that you do have the opportunity to come to this room right now and listen to somebody condemn the government and not be afraid of having people come in with guns. And, and you know, there's so much to be grateful for every single day that once you start to look at life that way, it's hard to be sad. It's hard to be depressed because you realize you have so much. And for Mark and me to be able to get so much support from people that keeps us going and I try to put that support back out there you know I try to take all that energy and love and encouragement and every week I do a video updating people about Mark and what activism I'm up to and people tell me that keeps them going and it inspires them to take action too um, one question yeah, yeah can we, is there anything we could do to help support Mark
mark why he is in jail, letters, um, care packages, any Absolutely. Letters Mark loves to receive. The best ones to get are people writing to him saying, this is what I'm doing to make a difference. <laughs> you know, let him know what you're doing, even if you just wrote a report in school or you're doing an article for a local paper, anything and everything at all that you can let him know you're doing to make a difference. That makes sure he knows that it's not in vain, that when he went down, the DEA th said that that was going to be the end of it, that they took down a big kingpin. Oh, get The Attorney General of the United States actually said, Mark, Emery is the most wanted international drug trafficking target in Canada and or in the in number 54 in the world list and the only one from Canada and that was in that DEA statement you can see at freemark.ca or cannabisculture.com they made it very clear why they went after him but they didn't realize that uh, they did strike him down and made him more powerful than anyone could imagine. And now there are little Mark Emery's all over the United States making a difference and raising hell. <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay. I could wrap up right now. I'd like to give you guys a few links if you're interested in keeping up to date. I don't know how many people are actually here from Canada. Am I the only one? Oot and a boot and a new, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, excellent. So, so you can keep up to date on what we're doing. Our website, Cannabis Culture, covers a lot of American stuff. I mean, we have to look to the U.S. We are working together. We have allies across the border. We're brothers and sisters in arms. You guys with the arms, we without. You know? <laughs> but uh, but you know, go to CannabisCulture.com. And you can find out more about Mark. If you want to read about his history, his actual past, uh, Wikipedia has a good little description. But there's also a movie out by a libertarian. Actually, he calls himself an objectivist. Uh, but he documented Mark's entire life and how his activism went alongside marijuana legalization and how like all this change happened. Uh, he tied it in a lot with Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and that sort of thing. And it's a long, you know, if you've got five hours to kill, <laughs> it's a really long documentary. But it's not just about Mark. It's about a really fascinating um, angle of how Mark managed to make such a difference that so many people don't yet know about and might never know about, but still laid a lot of groundwork for more people to continue on their battles today. So he's a hero to me and I love him and I'm going to stand by him and I'm so grateful for everybody I've already met who sent me support and I just want to pledge from everyone that you will continue to fight for liberty no matter how scary it gets. Um, you've got to take a stand because if they silence us all then all hope is lost so never stop screaming. Thank <laughs> you.